Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 130 on bats with Dr. Nancy Simmons of the American Museum of Natural History. So an episode on bats in time for Halloween was a very specific listener request and one that we couldn't say no to. So Jacob, we hope you enjoy it. We really do try to fulfill your episode requests whenever we can, so please keep sending them in. Our big news today is that we just launched our Patreon account, so if ever you wanted to contribute to the development of the show, now's the time to do it. Podcasts really don't cost a lot to start or run, but the steps that you need to take to improve the show, well, those can quickly ramp up. We've always avoided trying to bring money into the equation, but perhaps in doing so, we've actually limited our growth. For the last few years, we've got by with the generous donations of a handful of regular contributors. You know who you are, we love you, and we don't thank you nearly as much as we should. But we've never offered anything to these people in return. With Patreon, we hope to be able to give something extra back to anyone able to help the show to grow. We asked you, our audience, which kinds of benefits you wanted to receive for your donations and how much you valued each. The Patreon tiers that we have come up with reflect that process. These benefits are multimedia heavy, they are not restricting any of the current content we produce in any way, and they are heavily weighted towards lower budgets. So be sure to check out what we're offering at patreon.com forward slash paleocast. And the best thing about all of this is that our podcast, what you're listening to right now, will only be changed for the better. We promise you that all the funds raised will be funneled back into the show to improve our audio for new equipment, software subscriptions, more hosts, IT support, everything we need to make the show better for everyone. So however big or small, thanks to all those who contribute. And so finally, after all of that fundraising pitch, we can now jump straight into this approximately Halloween themed episode on the evolution of bats. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Nancy. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Right. With everyone that comes on, we like to get to know them before we start getting into the details of the fossils that they study. So can you tell us all how you got into the field of paleontology? Well, I guess I was always interested in the natural world and always interested in how things evolve to be the way that they are. And when I was in college. I studied anthropology and biology and geology. And then I was lucky enough to get accepted to a PhD program in paleontology for graduate school. And at that point, I actually started working on really ancient fossil mammals from the age of dinosaurs. And while I enjoyed that, I felt that I didn't I didn't know enough about the biology of the animals. And bats were just really cool. And so almost on a lark, I decided to apply for um, a position, a postdoctoral position after I graduated to work on fossil bats. And I never really expected to spend the rest of my career working on bats, but that's how it's turned out. Wow. So you, you hadn't considered that until you looked at that postdoc. Bats weren't a, a huge interest of yours. Yes, indeed. And and then when I came to the American Museum of Natural History, I also started working on living bats. And a lot of my research for the last 30 years has involved working with living bats as well as fossil bats, because I, I find that I can learn a lot from the paleontology of bats. It helps me understand the, the living bat fauna that we have today and vice versa. It, Working in the field with living bats makes me appreciate even more the the fossil bats that I get to work with. So it's 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 been great. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. It's it's great that you have uh, a group that's still extant today that you're able to do that with. I mean, mine are pretty much entirely extinct, so you can only do it really by proxy of like their closest relatives. But uh, with bats, you can study them just as they are, I guess. So. Yep. Yep. Indeed. <laughs> 
So where has your research led you? And and by that, I mean, like, where's it taking you geographically? Where's it taking you academically, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that's the, my career's now been over 30 years. So there's a lot of places both ways in that. Um, so with respect to the fossils, it was only this last summer that I got to go out in the field to one of the localities where some of the greatest fossil bats have been found. Before that, I was working on material that other people collected and which I was lucky enough to get to work with as well, but was already held in museums in various places. Um, my field work with living bats um, is mostly based in Central and South America. I have a big field program in Belize. And actually, I'm heading there in two weeks for the first time in two years to get back in the field with living bats. And I've also worked in Southeast Asia, um, Peru, French Guiana. Anyway, I, I, I love travel and I find it to be really exciting to get to combine my science with travel to interesting places. Mm. So have you actually managed to find your own fossil bat specimen now? No, unfortunately not. Fossil bats are actually very rare. And part of the reason for that seems to be that they're just very small and fragile animals. And when they are fossilized, in probably in most cases, they're in bits and pieces. And it's very hard to tell if you're looking at a single tooth or a single bone, whether it's from a bat or not, frankly, because their their teeth um, are similar to many other kinds of mammals. Um, and we'll probably talk about that later more. Um, there are a couple of fabulous fossil localities, though, one in Wyoming in the Green River Formation and one in Germany at Messel that were um, these deposits were laid down in fossil lakes with very fine grained silt, um, apparently quickly covering dead bats when they fell into the water. And so they preserved whole skeletons in those localities. And those are the ones I find most exciting because we can look at the whole animal rather than just a few bits and pieces. Otherwise, most bat fossils come from caves and they're usually disarticulated. So they're, you know, basically bone piles. <laughs> and there's some great fossils from some caves too, but I, I find it most exciting to be able to look at the entire skeleton of an extinct animal rather than simply a small piece here and there. Oh, for sure, definitely. And and we'll get on to the Green River and Messel uh, soon, but I think the best thing to do first is to just make sure we're all on the same page and ask the simplest question like we all know what bats look like and how they live but what actually is a bat well a bat is a flying mammal and it's a member of a clade and it's a single evolutionary lineage which evolved powered flight sometime probably between 65 and 55 million years ago. Um, so they all share a common ancestor and they share a number of, of unique traits that we don't see in other mammals. Most of those are in the postcranial skeleton and relate to the way in which the forelimbs have been modified to support the wing membranes. Um, there are other um, unique traits of bats in the rib cage, in the shoulder girdle. Um, most of the postcranial skeleton has been modified to support flight. And so that's, that's the big unique thing that sets bats apart from, from other mammals. And are they monophyletic? And by monophyletic, if you're not familiar with the terms, that would be if you got the family tree of all mammals, for instance, if you made one snip and took that branch off, is that bat that you would be holding in your hand without making any other cuts or without combining two different branches together? Yes, bats are monophyletic. There was a controversy back in the 1990s about whether or not bats were monophyletic. It was thought for a while that perhaps the old world fruit bats, which rely on vision for orientation, and the rest of bats, which rely on echolocation um, for orientation and prey capture and so on, were actually two separate evolutionary lineages that didn't share a flying common ancestor. Um, and that 
hypothesis was based on morphology, um, that is the structure primarily of the brain and the visual system. Um, but the 90s were also the time when we started to be able to collect DNA data, DNA sequence data to sort out relationships of animals and plants and everything else. Um, and so looking closely at the genome of living bats made it very, very clear that they are a single group. They are a monophyletic lineage. And so power flight only evolved once in mammals and everything that looks like a bat is a bat and is a member of a single evolutionary lineage. Okay. So we've got those, um, two different types of bats, the ones that are more visual, the others that are echolocating. How diverse are bats in general? Well, bats are the second most diverse group of mammals in terms of living mammals. There are over 1,400 species of bats, and the number just keeps going up. Um, so they have a worldwide distribution. Primarily, their greatest diversity is in the tropics. And um, the only other group of mammals which can contains more living species are the rodents. In terms of fossils, we know of over 200 fossil species of bats. Um, so they're also very diverse in terms of their fossil record, although most of those fossils of, of um, bat species are, the, are, um, are fairly isolated teeth and things like that. But we know that there were a lot of, of bat species as we go back in time. Okay, so that's the diversity, but then another way of looking at things is disparity. So how different are these bats from each other? Are they all doing the same batty things, but then they've just got minute details within like a toe bone, or are they wildly different? Well, I think both of those things is true, uh, are true. Um, the disparity across bats... It's interesting. There's a family of bats called the Phylostomidae, which lives in the New World. And ecologically speaking, um, they do more different things than any other group of mammals. So the Phylostomid bat family just by itself um, includes species which eat insects, which are carnivores. Other species feed on nectar and pollen only. Other species feed on fruit. Um, and the vampire bats are part of that group. And so within that one family, we have a huge amount of ecological diversity, and that's also reflected in morphological diversity. So the bats which feed from flowers have long, slender rostrum or, or nose region that they can insert down into flowers, and they have long, specialized tongues for reaching pollen and nectar inside the flowers. Bats that eat fruit tend to have really short faces. Some of them look almost like human skulls if you look at them sideways. So they have really strong bite force for, for plucking small, hard fruits and, and, and biting through them. Vampire bats have very specialized dentition um, for making little slices in the skin of the, the animals from which they, they uh, obtain blood. Carnivorous bats have skulls that look remarkably like wolves, <laughs> just a lot smaller. Um, wow. of, yeah, it's amazing. I, I once had a, uh, a 3D printed wolf skull that, that usually when, when people 3D print a, a, a CT scan of a skull of something, they make it bigger. <laughs> but in this case, somebody had taken a, a wolf skull and printed it at very small size. It was only a couple of inches long. And I had a, a bat skull from a carnivorous, a big carnivorous bat, which was almost exactly the same size. And when you put them side by side, they look remarkably similar. Uh, <laughs> that was a real thrill. Little flying wolves. Yes, yes, exactly. So these, these big, and these are quite large bats with a wingspan of, of, of a couple feet, to, uh, even a bit bigger than that. And um, those bats are, are predators. So they fly through the forest looking for mice and frogs and lizards and even other bats that they eat. Um, so we have a lot of differences in ecology across bats, um, and that's reflected in their morphology. Also, body size can vary a lot. So the smallest bat is called the bumblebee bat. It's a species that only lives in Southeast Asia today. And the entire bat is um, 
basically the end of the, the, the size of the body of the bat is the size of the, the end of your little finger. And its wingspan is only a couple of inches across. So they only weigh a few grams, incredibly tiny little animals. And then we have great big flying foxes, which are fruit eating bats, which if you imagine a cat with, with wings, which when you spread them out are about six feet across, that's about the body size. Of these animals. Yeah. I, I remember seeing my first um, fruit bat in uh, australia and i did not know like i knew there were about but i didn't know they were as common as they were like especially in a, a city as well as just in the suburbs and i just like looked up at the clouds and i could just see all of these giant yeah bats just flying yeah. around yeah yeah it's amazing gorgeous so, things. you know they are they are so the diversity of bats that we find in in um in many places, you know, you, you did mention that our, our bats or many of them very similar to one another, all the same. And the, the a lot of the diversity of bats actually um, does, in fact, encompass that aspect to it. So there are many, many species of bats which look very similar to each other. And those bats do um, have similar ecologies and morphologies, but they may be subtly different. So a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. Um, their teeth may be slightly different. What they choose to eat may be slightly different. The, eco the echolocation calls they make may be slightly different. So the, the diversity of bats includes both groups in which there are multiple species which are quite similar. And at the same time, if we look a little more broadly, then we have groups which are very different from one another. So it, it's a complex pattern. So we've already likened bats to wolves and to cats in this episode so far. What? Who are the closest living relatives? Well, interestingly, it looks today like the closest living relatives of bats are probably actually the ungulates, so hooved mammals. So, so for instance, something like an antelope? Yeah, so... If we go back in time to the late Cretaceous period, so we're you're talking about 65 million years ago, and then the end of the age of dinosaurs and the transition into the early tertiary when mammalian groups began to diversify, the common ancestor of a lot of groups today, which are very different, was probably some sort of small scrambling animal, you know, that may have climbed bushes and not arboreal, so not like completely up in the trees, but neither was it something large and ground dwelling. So the common ancestor of well, the bats and the ungulates and the insectivores and even the carnivores was probably something that looked quite different from what any of those groups look like today. And then there was a burst of diversification in which a variety of different lineages went off on different evolutionary tangents. And one of those ended up being bats and one of them ended up being ungulates. So you've already mentioned that they evolved potentially as early as 65 million years ago, which was when the end Cretaceous mass extinction was. Has there been a a link between the two events? No. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me about bat evolution is that if we look at the evolutionary relationships of bats in other mammalian orders like the ungulates and the carnivores and the insectivores, it seems clear that they must have, these groups must have separated from one another around 65 million years ago. And of course, a lot was going on on the planet then. So perhaps there is some link to the end Cretaceous event. We don't really know. But the earliest bat fossils, where we can look at a fossil and say this is a bat, are about 55 million years old. So there's actually a 10 million year gap between when the bat lineage must have separated from its closest relatives and when we find the first bat fossil. And that gap, we just don't know what was going on with the bat lineage. Then. So we don't have any... We don't have any pre-bats. Yeah. We don't, we don't have a nice array of fossils showing us the transition between the common ancestor that bats share with other mammalian orders and the, the, you know, the first things that are clearly bats. And so we don't know the order of events of acquisition of 
that Betty traits, so to speak. Um, one of my personal hypotheses about this is that we actually do have members of that lineage, fossils from them, I mean, sitting around in museums, but we're just not recognizing them as part of that group. Um, and that's because bats have teeth, which have a morphology, which is very common among mammals that eat insects. So they have what are called tribosphenic teeth, which um, in which the, the molar teeth in particular um, are comprised of, of interlocking sort of triangular ridges, which, which slice against each other when the upper teeth come against the lower teeth or live the other way around when the lower, when the jaw closes, in other words. And um, when you have isolated teeth, it's sometimes hard to know what animal they came from. And I think there were a lot of insectivorous mammals around in the early tertiary period. And unless we have other parts of the skeleton that show us that this has to be a bat, I think we're just missing a lot of fossils which might belong to that lineage because they're just incomplete. And as a result, you know, the first bats in the fossil record that we know of are clearly bats. There's no question that these animals are bats. And then the mystery, what was going on during that 10 million years before we start finding these things, which were clearly bats. We just don't know the answer to that question. Well, thank you for asking yourself the question and then answering it when I couldn't get the question out coherently <laughs> is much appreciated. I'm glad one of us is on the ball today. Um, so other characteristics of bats. So can we ever say anything about the evolution of the echolocation? Is there a, a, a physical proxy of that that we can see in their fossils, like a, a well-developed ear bone or something like that? Yes, actually there is. So bats have an echolocation system in which the calls that they make are produced in the larynx of the voice box. And then those, those high frequency sounds are beamed out either through the mouth or the nose, depending on the species. And then bats listen for their turning echoes. And all this happens at very high frequencies. And the high frequency sounds are received in part of the inner ear, which is the the, the, the bone which encases it is the cochlea and the base and the cochlea is a spiral structure inside. So it looks sort of like a ball that has a spiral space inside it. And that basal turn of the cochlea is where high frequency sounds are received, are, are received in process. And, um, by comparing living bat skulls, which are known to, uh, or the skulls of bats, which are known to echolocate today with non-echolocating bats. It was discovered a long time ago that the cochlea is much larger in echolocating bats than in non-echolocating bats. So size of the cochlea is one clue, which if you have a bat with a big cochlea, then it was probably an echolocator. And if you have one with a small cochlea, it probably wasn't. Also, the structure of the bones, which help support the voice box where sounds are being created. Um, there's a series of small bones called the hyoid apparatus, which connects that to the base of the skull. And many of those, they're, they're sort of a small chain of bones. And in non-echolocating mammals, those bones don't actually articulate with the ear. They're, they're, they help support the musculature of the throat, but they don't actually glom onto the skull physically. And, um, but in echolocating bats, the, the end of that chain of bones is a small bone called the stylohyle. It actually contacts the cochlea and sort of wraps around it. And the thought is that this connection between the throat and the ear helps transmit, um, information to the, the bat's ear that it has just made a sound. So it, it, it helps the, um, processing of, uh, of, of the sound so that the animal can distinguish the sound of its call going out from the sound of its call coming back, basically. Anyway, so when we have a good, a well-preserved fossil bat, when we can look at the base of the skull and measure the relative size of the cochlea and look at the form of the stylohyle bone and see whether it's wrapped around or, you know, articulating with and wrapping around the cochlea, we can, we can say with some clarity whether or not a bat, a fossil bat could echolocate or not. Sort of a long story, but, but it's an interesting one. Oh, it's fascinating. <laughs> 
And that was me trying to mansplain to you how this software prevents my audio coming out of your computer and going back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, what I don't know about computers and audio is, is, is <laughs> much. Yeah, I know a lot more about bats than I know about that. But it's the same process, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, yeah, so the one of the things that has to happen for a bat to effectively echolocate is it has to avoid self-deafening. And that's part of what this system seems to do is it allows the bat to sort of stop listening during the moment it's producing a sound and then start listening the microsecond it stops making the sound. Is it ever possible to determine whether a fossil bat was nocturnal? Do we ever have a diurn diurnal? Diurnal? Diurnal. Diurnal. Do we ever have diurnal bats? We don't have strictly, well, if we're looking at modern bat diversity, there are no animals in the bat group that we would call diurnal. There are some, however, that are active at dawn and dusk. And so it's interesting when you go out in a tropical forest to catch bats and there might be a hundred different bat species living there, you learn pretty fast which species are the ones that you're going to catch earliest in the evening. So the timing of bat emergence can vary considerably. Um, for fruit-eating bats, like the flying foxes we were talking about earlier, many of those species roost out in the open, so they roost out in trees and things. And so they can be reasonably active in terms of, of uh, you know, starting to wake up and starting to move around um, before it's totally dark. But I would say there is no diurnal bat that we know of. And so we guess, because we also think that the many, if not all, of the earliest members of the mammalian group uh, were probably nocturnal to begin with. And so it's quite likely that bats are nocturnal, not because they've started from a diurnal ancestor and, and evolved this some sort of switch into being active at night, but that they just never gave up being active at night. But for something like a fruit bat whose uh, food source stays there day and night what what kind of advantage or what kind of reason do they have for remaining nocturnal fruit bats um of the family pteropodidae so these are the flying foxes and, and their relatives do not for the most part use echolocation to navigate or find their food so how do they find their food they use vision and olfaction so smell and um they if you're out at night in a forest, you can. There's often a lot of light and present, so from the moon, from reflection off of clouds and things like that. And fruit bats have a visual system which allows them to see a lot in the dark. So they have they have a lot of sensors in their eyes which are particularly good at low light levels. So we think of mammals as that are visual mammals is not being able to see well in the dark, but think about cats, you know, you let your cat out at night and it, it, because they have eyes, which are also good at low light levels, they can maneuver and see where they're going quite well at, at light levels where you would not be able to do so <laughs> because as primates, we are diurnal animals that have a visual system adapted for high light levels. We've already spoken a, a tiny bit about the taphonomy of bats, how they are preserved and what kind of environments they are preserved in. Uh, you've mentioned uh, the Green River Formation and the Messel oil shales. Uh, can you give us a little bit more information about the fossils there and how they're preserved and what they look like and how splendid they are? Oh, absolutely. So the Green River Formation and Messel are very different in the type of preservation of bat fossils, but the end result is similar in the two places that we get complete skeletons rather than fragmented skeletons. So the Green River Formation is, is the oldest of the two. It's about 52.5 million years for the, the, the beds that preserve bats. And it's very fine-grained siltstone. And what we get are basically pancake fossils. So apparently a bat dies, it fell into this fossil lake, 
was covered quickly with very fine grained sediments and then compressed over time. So we get the whole skeleton, but it's very, it's flat. In other words, like it was run over by a truck. In the Messel oil shales, the preservation is different. It was also probably a lake environment, but the, the, um, uh, there, there were more organics in the uh, um, silt combination that preserve the fossils. They're also flat, um, but they're, they're more delicate in terms of the uh, preservation of the bones. However, again, we get whole animals out of missile. Right now, we know of more species of bats are known from Messel and, and than there are from the Green River Formation, but we're finding new species in the Green River Formation too. So probably the real diversity in both places was higher than we know yet, and we may still find new fossils there. So Green River is uh, a very commercially well-produced uh, fossil sites in which uh, I'm sure everyone will be familiar with the nightier fishes. Um, if yes. you see a fossil fish for sale in a fossil shop, probably come from Green River. Is there a problem with the selling of bat fossils and other rarer fossils from there that you know of? No, actually not from the Green River Formation. There's actually a great relationship between Fossil Butte, um, which is a uh, national monument that's in the Green River Formation, which showcases the, the fossils from there. And the, the, uh, the curator there has a really good relationship with the, the owners and managers of the local commercial quarries. And indeed, the, the way the commercial quarries are run is the, the public can go and, and pay the, the quarry uh, uh, manager or owner um, a fee and then split rock and look for fossils. And for when the fossils they find are... Um, common ones like Nydia, the, the fish you, you mentioned, um, then the, the person is allowed to keep those fish because there's, you know, billions of them. But when a rare fossil is found, the quarry owners bring it to the attention of the, uh, of the fossil butte, uh, the National Monument staff. And as far as I know, the, the, um, in, in recent years, New fossil bats that have been discovered there, they are sold, but they have been sold to museums. So they make a point of trying to make sure that the special fossils um, get into the hands of scientists. So it's, it's really exciting to go out there and collect fossils. I did that this summer <laughs> for the first time. It was fabulous. And I, there, I also got to see some, uh, there's some new fossil bats coming out and which will be going into the, you know, into museums and not into you know, people's houses to be displayed on their mantelpieces or something like that. So I think there's a great relationship between the quarry owners and, and you know, the scientific world. That's awesome. Um, so in these two lakes, I'm, I'm just thinking about how a bat went from being in the sky to being preserved in the water at the bottom of a lake. Do they die on the wing or is it more likely to have gotten into trouble whilst taking a drink uh what happens if a bat gets into water can they get out um well bats can swim they they basically do the butterfly <laughs> with their wings um mike you know i i can't I, I would just be guessing just like you um probably some of the the fossils which occur in some of these lakes simply are bats that died somewhere near the shore and washed in, you know, with a, a, you know, heavy rainfall just floated down and then sank. It's also possible that some bats might've gotten into trouble drinking. Um, you know, you catch a wingtip and you spin over and you fall into the water and maybe you can't get out or maybe you're too far from shore. All these things are possible. We're just, we just can't tell. And, and most bats aren't living um, I was going to say most bats aren't living around lakes. Uh, it was just a, a great assumption that most bats live in caves. Um, well, bats basically live everywhere. Um, so there are bat species that are adapted for foraging over water. So there's some bat species that always roost and always forage over water. Others that never do. Um, the preservation of bats in Messel and Green River are probably just a subset of the bats that were out there in the world at that time. And it was probably the ones that happened to commonly forage around lakes. 
there are quite likely other species that never did that. And when a, one of my experiences as a scientist collecting bat specimens, living bats back in the 90s in the tropics in South America, is that if I prepared a specimen and I wasn't paying sufficient attention, like I set it aside, you know, went into the table and went to do something else for a couple hours. If you come back, I had bat specimens that were almost completely consumed by ants just in a couple of hours in the tropics. So there are lots of things that can happen very quickly to a small dead animal, particularly in the tropics, which would make it you know, impossible for it to become a fossil. And so um, fossilization of a small, fragile animal like a bat is probably, was probably a rare event. And that's part of why we don't find very many of them. Yeah, so I'm re- really showing my bat ignorance then. I mean, everyone knows that I work on arthropods, so I'd be more familiar with their prey of, of the insectivorous really? ones. But um, yeah, so I was trying to get to uh, caves and the preservational potential of the bats within caves. So do you see a, a difference in the groups that are preserved, for example, in Messel and in Green River, and the the bats that you get preserved in caves? So most of the bats that are preserved in caves or have been preserved more recently. So there are a lot of species of living bats, which are cave bats. And so that's where they prefer to roost during the day. And then, of course, there are fatalities and they fall to the bottom of the cave. And if they're preserved, you know, that's great. But the the majority of caves situations are Pliocene, Pleistocene caves are where we find bats. We don't have Eocene caves, you know, cave cave, uh, faunas um, that that were preserved in that time period. So it's sort of comparing apples and oranges. We have these two amazing sites, Messel in the Green River and the early Eocene, that were were fossil lakes. And then we have cave deposits from the Pliocene and Pleistocene that have a whole different set of bats um, and in different parts of the world as well. But, you know, karst formations in Southeast Asia and the Caribbean and so on, those are the places where we have lots of cave fossils. And... Um, that was millions of years later in time. So it's a different snapshot in time of, of, of a fauna which had been evolving for millions of years in place in, in these various areas. The bats that live today in Wyoming, um, you know, it's a very different habitat than it was back in the Eocene. And uh, the, we don't have any idea really what the habitats or bats were like in some of the places that we have, you know, Pleistocene caves where we have fossils, we don't know what was going on back in the Eocene. So it's sort of a, it's sort of a mix and match situation where we do the best we can with the fossils we have, but we don't have uh, a continuous fossil record in any one area of bats through this time period. So in these Pleistocene cave deposits, you've said before that they are they're not complete, they're a lot more fragmentary. Do you just have kind of a large homogenous group of individual bat elements that you can only really say there were bats here? Well, no, you can you can often associate them. Um, well, not all of the bones, but yes, it, if you can imagine a bone pile with all of the bones from a whole bunch of different animals. So you have a bunch of different skulls, you have a bunch of different humeri, a bunch of different finger bones and so on. And some parts of the bat skeleton are more diagnostic than others. So the humerus, the upper arm bone in bats, um, because it's so important in the flight apparatus in part, um, we see a lot of modifications of both ends of that bone, which are which can tell us a lot about relationships of that bat. And then if we have skulls, as well, we may be able to put, you know, humerus, humerus A, morphology type A may always go with skull type, you know, X and so on. So we can actually, we can actually associate a lot of the elements, even if they're all mixed up together and, and figure out how many species we had and what families they belong to and so on. I worked on some cave fossils from the Dominican Republic, which were just fabulous, whole skulls that, you know, could easily be identified to species of, um, you know, closely related to living bats. And we were able to associate the humeri with those skulls 
based on, you know, what we know about living bats. But then we end up with, you know, boxes of these bones that we don't, you know, like toe bones and, and, and finger bones where we could say, well, that's a bat bone, but we don't know which of these various species it went to. Cool. And, and is there any indirect evidence of bats in the fossil record? Uh, in caves, especially because I'm thinking of stuff like guano? Well, there are... Um, Guano, fossilized guano deposits, I suppose, in some caves, but those would not go back far enough in time, I think, to be of much value. I don't know of anybody um, making claims about presence of bats in, you know, in ancient caves based on guano alone. Um, yeah, I I had absolutely no uh, line of evidence to draw that question on. It was just me thinking. Oh no, that's fine. There's also, you know, we we think of for many mammals or animals in general, there are trace fossils, so fossilized footprints, for example. Well, bats fly and they roost hanging upside down in trees or on surfaces, caves or whatever, and so we don't find fossilized footprints of bats in the fossil record. Is it possible to determine the paleoecology of any of these bats, fossil bats? Well, we can use a number of different types of information data from the fossil record to reconstruct the ecology of a fossil bat. One of the main things is the morphology of the teeth. Um, we can tell whether a bat was likely an insectivore or a fruit eater or a nectar feeder based on its teeth. And all of the ancient bats that we have from both Messel and the Green River all, are all clearly insectivores based on their teeth. But there are other lines somewhat less direct um, than the morphology of the bat itself. And actually in Messel, there are some bats preserved with stomach contents. Um, so we know from looking at what's preserved inside this, the, the rib cage, basically, of some mesal bats, some of what they ate. So the details of their arthropod prey. There are, there's evidence of small moths. There's evidence of caddisflies um, and some other insects which are associated with aquatic environments. So this fits well with the fact that the fossils themselves were found in a fossil lake. So it, it's evidence that these animals were eating a variety of different insects and also that they were eating insects which are associated with water. Wow, that's fascinating that you can get so much from that. Um, are there any particularly noteworthy fossil bats, either for their morphology or their ecology? Well, one of my favorites is a bat called Onychonycterus finii from the Green River Formation, and that's actually a fossil I was lucky enough to lead the team that described that as a new species of bat back in 2008. And Onychonycterus is unusual because it was clearly a flying bat. There's no question that it could fly based on the structure of its, its, its hands, its arms, clearly supported wings. Um, the rib cage makes it clear and the, the scapula, the shoulder blades, that it had a fully functional flight apparatus. But looking at its um, ba the basic cranial region of the skull makes it clear to me that it was probably not an echolocator. So it gives us a, a, an image of, of basically an early bat that had already achieved powered flight, but not yet evolved echolocation. So this is, it's not exactly a missing link, but it, it does give us an indication that flight evolved before echolocation in bats. Wow, that's great that you can tell the order of those evolutionary innovations. I, I guess it'd be kind of weird if you had bats walking around and echolocating on the floor. Yeah, there, there's a number of different hypotheses about the order of acquisition of flight and echolocation. And um, one of the hypotheses is that they evolved at the same time, because actually to produce the sounds necessary for echolocation requires a great deal of energy because they're they're not just high frequency sounds they're high intensity sounds and so the flapping of wings actually compresses and and um then as, as the as the bat flaps 
it compresses and expands the lungs. And so it basically the, the action of flight can make echolocation less costly because those, those great exhalations that are needed to beam out high intensity echolocation calls can be produced by the flapping wings. And so one of the hypotheses has always been that that, that flight and echolocation evolved at the same time. But I do believe that the fossil of Onychonectra shows us that, at least in this lineage, flight came first. Okay, so the whole point of this episode was that it was a look at bats at Halloween in the spooky season. So let's have a look at probably the most obvious candidate for this, uh, the vampire bat. So are vampire bats monophyletic again or is it purely an ecological grouping like if they drink blood they're a vampire bat no matter which family they belong to well in fact vampire bats are a single lineage of bats there's three living species and um, at least one extinct species i can think of there may be more than one uh extinct species i mean but yes it's a monophyletic group um Blood feeding evolved only once in bats, and this is within the family Phylostomidae, which is this very diverse group of neotropical bats I was talking about earlier. Um, so the three species of vampire bats, um, some of them feed on primarily on sleeping birds, and then the common vampire bat, the, the one that, that we're all used to seeing most often, Desmodus rotundus, feeds primarily on sleeping mammals. That is incredibly specific that they choose which prey. Yes. And well, I had never heard of them feeding on birds before. Yeah, so the different species definitely have different preferences in prey. But um, with the one that feeds on birds, do they crawl between their feathers? Are they incredibly small? Oh, no, they're, the, they're basically the same size. No vampire bat is very big, um, so you know they would easily fit in the palm of your hand. Uh, you know, the wingspan when they've put their, extend their wings out of probably eight inches or something like that. Anyway, so birds we think of as being completely covered by feathers, but in fact, their legs and their feet are not. And so the vampires which feed on birds basically creep up to them, birds that are sleeping up in trees. They would fly up to the tree and crawl along the tree and tree branch, and then they feed from the legs and feet of the sleeping bird. Wow. I am learning so much about bats that I did not know. <laughs> and how, how does this diet compare to other bats in terms of the energy provision? Well, blood as a food, um, it contains... A you know, basically all that these animals need to live. There's a lot of protein in blood. And actually, it's probably a more complete food source than, for instance, nectar. Nect um, you know, the vampires are not the only bats which subsist on a liquid diet. Um, bats which feed primarily from nectar from flowers are also living on a a liquid diet, but that liquid diet contains mostly sugars and not very much protein. And so as far as a food source, blood is an amazing food source. So these bats, that's all they need in order to survive. <laughs> so you heard it here on PaleoCast, blood is an amazing food source. So Halloween. Happy Halloween! <laughs> um, and the one that's identifiable in the fossil record, is that from uh, modifications of the teeth you said? Yeah, so the teeth and skulls of vampire bats are very distinct from other bats. Um, they, in terms of their teeth, they've reduced the back teeth in the jaw. You know, you and I have molar teeth that we use for crushing um, and chewing, and vampire bats have no need to chew. So those teeth have become quite small. The teeth in the front of the mouth, though, um, the incisors and canines, um, have been modified so that vampire bats have have very sharp slicing teeth in the front of their jaw so that they can easily slice through the skin of their prey. This is not like a whole bunch of knives sticking out of their mouth or anything, but just think of a pair of little blades sticking out, sharp like razor blades. So one of the things about vampires is if you get a vampire bite, you may really not feel it. It's like a paper cut. 
It's not that deep, um, but it's, you know, very, uh, they don't make a, like take a chunk or anything out of you for the most part. They make, you know, a slice and then just lick at the wound with a tongue and keep the blood flowing. So it's not too circular puncture holes. It's not like a snake bite. It's a, it's a different kind of bite. I mean, it's designed to make a cut that will bleed. And do people ever get bitten by vampire bats? Yes, people do get bitten by vampire bats. So in the tropics, one of the um, roles which a mosquito net plays if you're sleeping in a, in a bed or a hammock may be to keep the vampire bats off. Um, they will prey on sleeping humans just as they'll prey on um, sleeping cattle and, and other mammals. So this can be a problem for disease transmission, but in most places where people live around vampire bats, they know they're there, and so they take precautions to avoid being bitten. And as a researcher, do you find the portrayal of bats in the media in horror films and computer games as these horrible things uh, problematic? Well, I think anything that misportrays an organism is is a problem. So yeah, I, I'm not thrilled by negative portrayals of bats because they're just not correct. And and I, I don't like people are are often frightened of, of of bats, and it's largely because they just don't know anything about them. If you think about the difference between bats and birds, people have a have a different perceptions of birds, but partly it's because they can see them. You know, birds are active during the day like we are, and so you can go out and you can see birds and you can watch them and you go, oh, that's really neat. But it's really hard to go out and see bats, right? And so there's just a lot of misperceptions about bats um, because it's not possible for people to see them easily and you know observe them and learn about them um and yeah you know what video games and horror movies do for any animals is, is not the best yeah true as someone who works on chelicerates seeing uh, how exactly. they prey spiders exactly exactly yeah so what is the can can you think of a single worst bat you've ever seen on screen or as a halloween decoration or something the worst bat I've ever seen. No, I can't really. I, you know, rubber bats with, you know, that are just misshapen and ugly. Bats are beautiful. <laughs> Living bats are just beautiful animals. You think about the, the you know, they have fur and they have these complex faces and these mobile ears. And, you know, they have, they're, they're warm and you hold one in your hand and, you know, they feel a little heart beating and, and they're just fabulous creatures, these amazing wings that they have. And to see them portrayed, you know, as an ugly rubber thing hanging on a string, you know, that makes me sad. I guess we've also got something uh, in common with Batman and Spider-Man. <laughs> It's true. Well, we also think about these these kinds of animals that do interesting and amazing things that we don't get to see. You know, they're sort of secretive and we don't get to see them as sort of having superpowers. So, you know, Batman and Superman or, or Batman and uh, Spider-Man, um, you know, bats kind of have superpowers. They can see with sound. They can fly. You know, how cool is that? So what kinds of things do we still not know about bats and their evolution? Oh, that's a really hard question. There's so many things we don't know. You know, we don't know what the bat lineage was like that first 10 million years after they separated from other mammals and, and we start finding the first fully formed fossils. Um, we don't know the pattern of distribution, uh, you know, how they moved across the planet during diversification. It's really interesting. By the late Eocene, we have bat fossils from every continent, but there's just such huge gaps. There's, you know, we just have no idea what was going on in the continent of Africa during most of, of uh, the tertiary in terms of bat diversity. But today it has enormous bat diversity. And, and, and oh, there's just so many things that we don't know. And is there a, a next big thing in bat research? Next big thing in bat research? Oh, I don't know. It, one of the things that fascinates me about bats is because they're so diverse um, ecologically, morphologically, in terms of what habitats they live in, and they're distributed all the way across the globe, except for Antarctica and, and the high Arctic, 
Uh, you can ask just about any bot, any evolutionary question you want to, and bats make a great study group because of this amazing diversity. And so, I, you know, certainly during my lifetime, there's going to always be tons of unanswered questions. And it's really exciting when we make new discoveries and, and learn new things. And I think it sort of certainly seems to me like we're never going to run out of interesting questions to ask about bats. And just to wrap everything up, if there was one fact that you would like the public to know about bats, what would that be? I guess it's that they're incredibly important members of ecosystems around the world and probably always have been um, because of the roles they play in um, pest management. They die, you know, eat tons and tons of, of insects everywhere they live, you know night after night after night, but they're critical pollinators for many tropical f plants that can't produce fruit without bats to pollinate them. Um, they, they play really keystone roles in, in the ecosystems where they live. And yet when you think about, or if I think when most people think about like a tropical forest or whatever, they don't think about bats, but the bats are there and they're playing really important roles. And this was probably true way back in time as well. And my second final question is, do you think that there are enough people working on bats? Do they get the academic attention that they deserve, given everything that you've just said then? Well, actually, there are a surprisingly large number of bat researchers around the world. We have you know, national and international meetings that on a yearly basis, well, up until the pandemic, where, you know, 400, 500 bat researchers come, and that's just part of the bat research community. There are a, a lot of people working on bats in a lot of different countries and a lot of different questions. And so actually, there's a very robust bat research community out there. And, and it's a really good thing to see. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. And happy Halloween. <laughs> happy Halloween. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone, with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So if you've liked this episode, please consider donating. And thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs. And follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.